Welcome, everyone, to DEI After Five, the show that focuses on topics across diversity, equity, and inclusion with some of the brightest minds in the industry. Here's your hostess, inclusive culture curator and coach, Sasha Thompson. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of DEI After Five. This is one that I have been really looking forward to because it's someone that I've met a couple of years ago and we've had some phenomenal conversations. And so I just really wanted to share some of the insights and some of those conversations with you. And so today, my guest is Jim Morris, who is a consultant in this space. And so welcome, Jim. How are you? I'm glad to be here. Thanks. Good. So for Jim, Jim, for those folks that don't know you, tell us just a little bit about yourself. Uh, great. Thanks. I've been, um, I've been working in the space of leadership development for about 30 years. And about 20 years ago, I had a kind of spear through the heart when I realized that, that that work was really hollow if it wasn't also really focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So started to learn more about that and understand that and, you know, as a white guy, I have I kind of felt like I had the option to learn about it. It's not something I had to find out about in order to be successful in my practice. But it also without it in my practice, it, it was, you know, I'm just not I'm just not wasn't as effective. So for the past 20 years, with thanks to people like you, I've uh, I've been on kind of a learning journey about how to really understand how to mesh uh, leadership development with diversity, equity and inclusion with a real focus on helping white leaders understand their role in it, just like me. So I get to teach myself along with everybody else. Great. Wonderful. And so, you know, we talked about, um, I guess, kind of when we met, what, two years ago or so? Seems like longer than that. Maybe Maybe. maybe a little longer, but yeah. (laughs) Maybe a little longer than that. Um, But we started having some conversations, right, about kind of the role of white men in this space, um, and some of the challenges, especially, you know, right after the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, when everything was kind of heightened um, around diversity, equity and inclusion, and it's, especially when it came to race. Right. And so talk to us a little bit about, you know, some of the challenges that you all you met with, you know, during that time, because, you know, again, you said you've been in the, the DEI type space much longer than the last two years. And so when that transition happened, talk to us a little bit about, you know, what you saw and experienced. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, uh, At the time, I actually was working as the chief consulting officer for a company we both know and did some work with white municipal diversity partners. And actually our firm was kind of at ground zero of the whole um, um, presidential order suspending the teaching of diversity, equity, and inclusion, specific words inside of that with government contractors. Um, And some of our documents were leaked and we ended up hearing ourselves being talked about on Tucker Carlson, which was pretty strange. Mm. Um, And at that time, you know, everybody kind of rushed into the work uh, in a way that I'm sure it made sense because a lot of people were trying to figure out what can I do to make a difference? So there was a lot of focus on training, but you and I've talked about this, that focus on training without a focus on application uh, was, you know, it was a, it was a hard tide to push against, you know, cause people were like, we just want to train our people because they're really anxious. It's like, well, if we're training them and you're not doing anything, we're actually not going to be serving you. So I'm still, I don't know about you. I'm still feeling and seeing some of that backlash. I get called from people who've been promoted inside their organizations to be the chief DEI person. And what they have going for them is they're a plant manager or they're a senior leader with a lot of charisma and follow through and they're solid, they're solid professionals, but they don't have a lot of background with DEI. Yeah. And the executive teams just kind of say, we're doing it. You take the job. Good luck. Have a nice day. Yeah. And there's, and it's a setup. It's a, I'm, yeah, it's a setup. Yeah. I, and I, we've talked about this, you know, I think it's one of two things you, you get someone exactly like what you talked about, right. That, has the charisma that's able to get things done, but doesn't have the background. So it's they're set up for failure or they go out and they hire these diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioners that have been doing it successfully at other places, but 
but don't give them the resources or understand what it actually takes to get the job done. So then again, they're set up for failure. And so it looks as if, you know, but the combination of those team things is why those roles only last two and a half years. You know, people last in those roles two and a half years because they're not they're not set up for sustainability. They're not set up for in really infusing DEI in throughout the organization. You know, we, I talk about it being part of the DNA of the organization versus, right. the, you know, off to the side thing. And so that's one of the challenges, you know, we saw then. What are you seeing now? Well, I'm seeing a resettling in the, in the or, in organizationally. I don't know what you're seeing. I'm seeing kind of a settling and a, and a recalibration around what really matters and how do we do this? I like, I like what I'm hearing around people being more interested, organizations being more interested in road mapping. Mm. Um, I'm still really worried about kind of the performative nature, particularly of these white held white run firms that you know, they, they want to do the right thing. They're just not sure what it is. There's still a learning curve there, I think. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think also, I'm sorry, so this is something you really taught me. And I actually talk about it in the book that we'll talk about in a bit, but, um, and you've been hugely instrumental is like, and just to continue to talk about it without actually doing anything about it, particularly for people of color. It's pretty traumatic. You know, it's not just for me, it's it, it, it can be traumatic, but more often than not, it's it's an intellectual or uh, an, an exercise that doesn't have a lot of emotion behind it. But, you know, people like you have been questioned about this by people that look like me for decades. And the cumulative effect of that's pretty huge. So I still see that happening and I still see a lack of awareness about that. It's what I know. I don't know about you. but Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm definitely seeing that. Um, and, you know, I've been talking about, you know, from aware. OK, we've been aware. We're aware, we're aware, we're aware. <laughs> like, where is right. that active? Like now, now what? What do we, we do here? But you touched on something, Jim, that I think is really important because it's a conversation that's starting to happen right now um, with practitioners is, you know, the white led firms in the space and how they're showing up and, you know, point blank, you know, profiting off of some anti-racist work, right? So it's like you're teaching about a system that you're benefiting from. And mm -hmm. so the question is, as this work continues to evolve, what does equity look like, particularly for some of those white firms? Yeah, well, I don't have the, I, I wished I had a glib and quick and, and, you know, smooth answer for that, but I don't yet. I mean, I'm, I'm setting up my own firm. I'm trying to understand more about what it looks like. I'm building an advisory board. I've made some decisions about I'm only going to partner with women or minority held organizations for, for the work that I do when I have to partner with groups. Um, and then really, for me, it's kind of like, on the one hand, saying, I don't do everything, I don't know everything. But on the other hand, saying, I do have some skills that are specific to what I do know and how to do it. So how do I work in a collaborative way with expert consultants and practitioners like you to do their work in a way that that takes into account what my my access to the audience of people that look like me. So I'm, you know, that's part of what I'm trying to use is people that, that are looking for more information about how do you show up as a white person or a white executive in this work? I can talk about that. I understand that. That's my sweet spot. You know, I just have to be careful not to have too much scope creep around what yeah. I know and what I don't know. Yeah. 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 So then that leads me to this book, right? So you have guest lights and dog whistles. I have it. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit about it. Well, what led you to write this? Yeah. Um, well, the the book actually has nothing to do with it. There's actually there a couple of people said, you know, this is a great idea, but it has nothing to do with what you're doing in terms of building a new practice. <laughs> and at some and at some level, they're right. But it's like again, we I was at ground zero when all that stuff came down. Yeah. One day we were shutting down all of our programs, and we were trying to figure out how to tell every consultant that worked for us that we couldn't ever say privilege. Right. And then two weeks later, we got more business than we ever knew what to do with. So um, the, the book really came from uh, in the summer of 2020, 2021, the group that was against teaching more about the real history of racism and discrimination in the United States. The group that was saying critical race theory is our problem. Um, they wrote a they wrote a field guide about it. 
so that everybody who wanted to disrupt meetings or interfere with strategy that talked about how schools and organizations were going to teach about discrimination, racism, and, and the bias that's been part of our society since almost day one, since day one. Um, they've had a they've had a field guide about it since 2021, and I was like, well, there's no book about how those of us that want to stand up for critical race theory, mm-hmm. or those of us that want to stand up for how to preserve. Really, we're talking about the preservation of literacy. You know, we're going to continue mm-hmm. to teach our kids what's real about what happens in the world, or are we not? So I wrote the book because it's like we got to give we got to equip people so that they know what to say when somebody starts questioning critical race theory. Of course, you know, I'm not going to get into it, you know, but the, the whole use of the term critical race theory it was like it it was a brilliant strategy because it makes it sound like this thing that they then said was the problem when of course it's not the thing that was the problem (laughs) it was a red it was a big red herring yeah you know and people i hear people say all the time well you know we're not going to teach critical race theory and i go well great so what is that why don't you tell me what it is well it's you know trying to make white people feel bad about themselves it's like no, that's actually not what critical race theory is. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's so, what the book's about. It's it's super short, as you've seen. <laughs> yeah. right. It's an it's a it's a good read. It's a good yeah. read. And you know, as I was you know going through it and reading it, um, what you just said, I think, was is a what has been happening. Right? People were equipped with the field guide, and going into these corporate trainings with all of the things to say, right? To be disruptive, to stop the training or to throw the facilitator off um, because they just did not want to participate in it. Now that they had, now that you have this book out, what would you want, who is your audience for it and how can they use it in that corporate setting great i'm you know this is probably a little grandiose for me to even hope for but i really want us as a community of dei practitioners to understand this book and to work with each other i'm hosting i've hosted a bunch of free webinars i've told everybody i'll continue to host them wherever somebody wants one but i really think that the book is for me the book was written for dei practitioners school board members school board Mm -hmm. leaders educational leaders anyone who's at the interface of the cancel culture around uh, critical race theory or at the interface of trying to help preserve historical literacy so that we continue to teach our children what the real history of the United States is, anybody who's in that position is, and may feel ill-equipped. So just give them more tools, more information, and hopefully over time, a support network where when somebody says, hey, man, I got this meeting coming up and I'm not sure how to show up for it. I want to, and I'm not saying I have all the answers, but I'd love to help organize and coalesce a bunch of people who are working on it. I did six free webinars, made like 500 people sign up. Wow. And like a third of them were lawyers, which was really interesting. So I just want to keep that going. I want to get to critical mass because my belief, and this is maybe arrogance on my part, my belief is if there are enough of us that actually understand what they're doing, Right. We can cancel. We can we can change this. We can yeah. the 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 voice of reason and truth can prevail in this one if enough of us understand what's happening. So. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because as you're talking and I'm thinking through my practice and what I'm doing, what I've actually stopped doing is talking or saying the words you know diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, or you know DEI. I've started thinking through, okay, what's the end result? What do I want people to do? What do I want organizations to do? And we focus on that versus getting stopped at the door because they don't want to have diversity training. Um, And it's because of kind of the dog whistles and, you know, all of the challenges that come with that, right? DEI is now seen as a negative thing and it's not. Um, And so, you know, I I started having conversations around like, okay, well, we want to make sure that everyone feels valued, seen, heard, and connected, right? That's what inclusion is about. We want to make sure everyone, that's the diversity piece of it, right? right? How do we do that? That's the equity piece. So it's, it's really talking, again, it's the 
going from awareness to action. Like, what do these things look like in action? Right. And then let's do the work from there. So I appreciate the book because I think it provides people with a foundation or a an opportunity to think through, okay, this is how I can say this or counter this argument. Um, they can see what the dog whistle is um, and understand it in context. Because again, I think that's a big part of this. Critical race theory is really understanding kind of the historical aspects of why decisions are made the way that they're made legally and all of these things, right? But without that context, none of this makes sense. So yeah. I, yeah, so it's like, I, I appreciate it because those are the small kind of, it's like, let's take a step back to understand what we're really talking about right? before we move forward. Yeah, and, and here's the, Here's the really weird one, though, Sasha, for me, at least, is the one, the one word, the, the word coupling that we're never talking about mm -hmm. ever is white shame. Mm. Right. And that's so much underneath all this other stuff. It's like we're still, you know, we're, we're listening to the music, but we're not really talking about the words. Right. Yeah. And the feelings behind it. And and I understand that. I mean, I'm empathetic to it. I have my own shame as a white person when I look back at what's happened and how uninvolved I was for so long and how I'm sometimes still involved but poorly in how I do things. It's not about being perfect. It's about being, being engaged and learning yeah, how to make reparations when we make mistakes. And uh, we got to find a way to kind of work through our shame on our own or with each other instead of projecting it onto the world and asking people that look like you to try and make me feel better. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So. Oh goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's a whole, that's a whole nother one. Yeah. So. That's a whole other conversation. One of the things that I have um, really started to think about is, and we talk about it when we talk in talking about sexual orientation, right? The binary, everything is so binary. And so, Shame is part of that continuum, but what I see people doing, particularly white people in this space, that when they start to feel shame or guilt, then it jumps straight, straight to white saviorism, right? Like, let me fix this. Let me be the savior. Let me be the Amen. one. To... <laughs> right? Which Amen. is also yeah. very damaging. And so how do you have those conversations where it's okay to be on a journey without going from one extreme to the other? Yeah, that's a great, a great question. My, my belief is uh, I'll speak for, I'll speak as a member of not the representative, but as a member of the white male cisgendered kind of, you know, older guy group is, is just one person is our natural tendency culturally is to go to problem solving. So we hear a problem, we think if we want to contribute to be helpful, because we were all taught to be helpful, that being helpful sometimes is to figure out what the problem is and then offer a solution. That's not, of course, what works, because that just reinforces, like you were just saying, that reinforces this notion of supremacy. It's like, well, you're one down, I'm one up, let me fix this for you. Mm -hmm. And that's not, that's not really helpful at all. What I think most of us have not looked at, myself included, until fairly recently, is like, what's in it for us? Not from a selfish standpoint, but what's our own um, enlightened self-interest? Why should I work on this? Not because it's good for you and I want to be the, the great white hope, but what's good, what's good about it for me? And there's a lot in it. And a lot of it, again, has to do with you and I've been talking about for a couple of years since we met, really, which is about trauma. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We all have our own trauma. The white shame thing, there's a lot of trauma there. So let's just let's get to the real conversation. If we could do that, we could start making some progress. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, you just touched on it. That people in general don't know how to deal with trauma. And so there's that cognitive dissonance of what to do um, when you're faced with trauma or dealing with it because we don't talk about it. Right. right. So many cultures just across race, we don't you ignore it. You get over it, right? You have thick skin or, you know, right. if you don't talk about it, it's not there. So we just put, you know, I call it the dirt in the corner. 
Like we'll just brush it over there in that corner and act like it's not there. Um, and so that's just a huge part of that. And how do we unpack that trauma? Right. As groups and as individuals. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And white guys have a lot of work to do because we were, we were taught about trauma. We were taught, we were taught that it didn't happen to us. Mm. Right. So it was like, we were, we were brought up in a culture of denialism and just like, that's what everybody else feels. Or that's what happens when somebody comes back from a war. It's not something that we're supposed to feel. And it's complicated because on the one hand, we're asking people to understand the systemic advantage they have while also saying they can be traumatized. So it's not like anybody is all, you know, all say all good, all fine, all right. normal without trauma, or, you know, it's only, everybody experiences all of this in some way, at, in some way or time. So part of the thing is how culturally do we make it okay for people that look like me to start talking about vulnerability? And that's part of why I love that work, because instead of like going right after white shame, let's just talk about everybody being vulnerable, right? And of course, you know, people, people of color, people of minoritized groups, they've been, they've been having to be vulnerable their whole lives, right? It's like, hello, say, welcome to the party. Okay, you're going to join us, which is actually okay. You know, that means we're all going to try and carry the water together. And that's the whole idea. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. We can continue talking forever. You know, so but as you're talking about trauma in this space, what I want to find out from you, because you've, again, been in this work for a while is how do you take care of yourself? Like, how do you fill your cup? Yeah. Well, how honest do you want me to be? Because part, <laughs> <it would> <laughs> part of it would say years of therapy and professional coaching to just kind of strip away the layers of protection that keep me feeling safe, even though I'm not mm. safe, right? Um, so that's kind of hard to admit to. Um, and then the other thing is I surround myself. I have, I am so fortunate. I have a support system, both in my personal life and in my professional life of people who, well, people like you, who I know I can call and say, Hey, I'm messed up about something. And I know that you won't judge me. You may not agree with me, which I also really appreciate, but you're there. You know, and part of what fills up my tank is what's reality. I sometimes don't okay. know. It's like, I can't tell where I am. So that really helps. And then for me, um, stepping, and this is something I'm, I'm learning how to overcome as a lifetime of workaholism and having my entire identity be about work, mm. which is, you know, which is not obviously really good, but more and more learning to step away. Like um, I'm in a mountain in the mountains right now. I'm going to go for a mountain bike ride and hike later. And being outdoors is like my, my church. And I need to give myself that time to get away and recenter. So that's me. Nice. Yeah, I had um, another practitioner on a couple of episodes ago. That was when she did her introduction. Um, she said, you know, she had to learn how to not introduce herself by what she does, but about mm -hmm. who she is. Right? right. So, Like she's a mother. She's a daughter. She's, you know, and she talked about her grandparents and being part of, you know, their um, the legacy of them and it was just so powerful because to your point we are workaholics and we constantly think about oh this is who i am defined by the work that we do right right yeah. so a, a, a consultant that we both know who's from europe from uh belgium he he actually once said to me he says hey just a piece of feedback when you're working with european audiences when you start telling them about what you do that's like talking about what kind of car you drive they don't they're not interested in that <laughs> <laughs> right right they want to know what's important to you what do you do with your free time what fills your heart up what inspires you mm -hmm. that's what they want to know about and it was like whoa okay yeah it's a whole different value set you know? yeah so it's good. and i think that's what has influenced me to ask people kind of what they how you fill your cup because i think right. it's so important that we tap into kind of those things right the mountains for you what what's important and central to who you are right Right. So, well, Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. And if people wanted to get in contact with you, how could they do that? Uh, my email is there or pick up a copy of the book. There's more information about how to get involved with this community I'm trying to build. And um, yeah, those are the, the two best ways. And Sasha, let me just say, I'm so glad you're out there doing what you're doing. 
uh, mm -hmm. it, it makes a huge difference. And I have learned so much from you. So I'm just, I'm super honored to be here and to be part of this. Thank you, Jim. Truly appreciate it. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you all for watching this episode of DEI After Five. You can continue to subscribe here on YouTube or you can follow us on your favorite podcast platform. And until next time, have a good one.